Donna Gentile exemplified the ideals of a contemporary American and international social movement that emerged during the 1970s and 80s. Led by its founder, Margot St. James, the Coyote Movement, an acronym for Call Off Your Old Tired Ethics, challenged society's conventional views of prostitutes as sex peddlers and social misfits. The movement lobbied for the decriminalization of prostitution and championed prostitutes' civil rights. Among those rights was the right to choose prostitution as an occupation and not to be subjected to rape, violence, police harassment, and exploitation. A lot of hookers are murdered in this country. I think it's because of, uh, well, as President Bush says, the archaic attitudes toward women in this country. But I think it's more than that because it's a, a criminalized system here where the victimization is institutionalized and the prostitute becomes a legitimate victim for rape, murder, uh, robbery, any kind of abuse, verbal abuse, and, and uh, physical abuse. I got a phone call right about midnight from, it was actually Gail Stewart, who at that time was with one of the radio, I think she was with Channel 8. And she asked me what my reaction was to the death of uh, one of my clients. And I said, I don't know who you're talking or what you're talking about. And that's when she let me know that they had found her body. Uh, she apologized for <laughs> calling me <laughs> almost at midnight. And, and all I could share with her is, you know, she was giving me information that I, did, that I had not previously had. And I didn't, uh, you know, my reaction would be shock. And she asked me if I had any idea, you know, uh, any information as to, and I said, and I stopped her and said, I'm just finding out about it. And so that, that wasn't much of a conversation, but it was, to me, that's when, I, that's when I discovered it. And in the course of the next few days, you know, it was all over the media uh, with, with all kinds of speculation as to, you know, where that came from, what happened to her and whether it was tied in with, with other serial uh, murders that had been occurring, or whether there was a different source. Donna Marie Gentile was born on August 22, 1962, to her parents Ellen Mary and Louis Francis Gentile, and was raised in Levittown, Pennsylvania, with her older brother Louis. Levittown was one of the earliest planned communities in America breaking ground in the early 1950s. The community was built on the idea of owning a perfect home in a perfect community. By the late 1960s, Levittown would become synonymous with suburbia, ridiculed by some as bland and ticky-tacky. Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes made of ticky tacky. Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes all the same. In 1971, when Chantilly was nine, her parents divorced. She lived with her mother while her brother Louis resided with her father. Louis characterized her home life as rough. He stated there wasn't a lot of love for her. When she was 14, her mother remarried. According to her stepfather, she was a troublesome teenager who was drinking, staying out all night, and skipping school. 
At the age of fifteen, Gentile dropped out of high school and ran away from home because she alleged that her stepfather molested her. After she returned, she was placed in a group foster home for troubled teenagers and made a ward of the court two years later. Gentile moved to San Diego after she turned eighteen. The exact date of her arrival is unclear. According to court records, she was living in San Diego in February of 1981 and working as a prostitute on El Cajon Boulevard, a popular location for prostitution and drug activity. Gentile lived a lifestyle that wasn't typical of most prostitutes living in San Diego in the 1980s. She didn't live on the streets, drove a car, and teetered among working mainstream jobs in prostitution. She worked as a security guard for three different companies and was a part-time trail guide for a local equestrian center. During her employment at the equestrian center, she purchased a horse named Fantasia, a horse she owned until her death. According to her attorney, Douglas Holbrook, she loved the horse and spent much of her money for its board and upkeep. In the 1980s, Gentile and other prostitutes worked the streets surrounding this park. Kathy Hardy is the founder and president of Freedom from Exploitation, an outreach organization for prostitutes. Manya Mitchell Davis has a master's degree in human behavior and is a certified addiction specialist who also sits at a prostitution impact board that provides assistance to prostitutes. Hardy and Davis were prostitutes during the 1980s, and Davis briefly knew Gentilly. I met up with her a couple of times. Uh, in passing and I can remember uh, listening to her. I don't remember what I talked to her about, but I can remember really listening to her. Um, maybe three times if I remember right. It could be more. Well, most of us um, saw each other on a regular basis, like almost all day, every day. Uh, in between getting money and, and buying drugs and uh, getting high and a lot of us got high together. I never remember, I'll, I would see her, uh, I would never actually see her buying drugs. I would see her leaving in and out what we call the spots. Um, and that's when we would talk. A lot of times if things were going on out on the street, we would stay on the side streets, mm -hmm. you know, until it kind of calmed down and pass the information to each other, what's going on. Exactly. And um, most of us were pretty paranoid. She was a lot more paranoid than usual than others. So that right in and of itself kept me from being around her. Um, she wasn't somebody that was around a lot. She was around a lot less. I, I, I think I remember saying, you know, she just got out here to kind of to myself. I'll see more of her probably later and just keeping her in mind. Um, but um, for a while, it, it seemed like I saw her more frequently and then you didn't see her anymore um, because I heard that she had got killed. Donna Gentile's illegitimate status as a prostitute often led to encounters with San Diego police officers. Some of those encounters developed into allegations of police exploitation and harassment. Gentile first met Officer Larry Averick, a San Diego Police Department patrolman, in February of 1981 when he took her on a civilian ride-along. According to Gentile, after the ride-along, Averick drove her to her apartment and they had sex. Averick maintained that he didn't know Gentile was a prostitute when he took her on the ride-along until he was told so by his fellow officers and that the police department approved the ride-along. Between February and March of 1984, Gentile was charged with prostitution three times. She hired attorney Douglas Holbrook to challenge those three charges. It was, it was a friend of hers who worked for the fire department and he sensed that there was a, uh, a problem. <laughs> That, that he knew that she had been charged uh, with prostitution and she had related to him that a couple members of law enforcement had some kind of relationship with her and they were claiming that they were going to help her out that she didn't need to worry about the charges they would take care of it but it was getting you know things were moving along and nothing was happening and so she expressed uh, a concern he contacted me and uh, ultimately had her come in and meet with me and we, we took on her case and when she, the first time she came to me, I basically said, 
you know, if your friends in law enforcement are going to help you, then they need to step in now because you've got a court date coming up, and you 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 know you can't rely on that if they're not doing anything. And she went back to them, and I guess they just they weren't committing, and so we went ahead. And I said, I, I can't handle it as a case in which someone's going to help you out. Either either we go through the legal process, or you have your friends take care of it, one or the other. And so she ultimately decided, you know, we 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 arraigned her, and her pleas of not guilty, and set the cases for trial. Gentile was convicted of only one of the charges. In June of 1984, Gentile had another encounter with Officer Averick when he approached her for sex during a San Diego Police Department prostitution crackdown campaign. She claimed that he told her that he would go easy on her if she had sex with him, and she complied. Gentile alleged that she and Averick had sex three or four times during that summer, and that Averick provided her with the locations of police officers so she could avoid arrest. Also in June, Gentile developed a relationship with the supervisor of the Cracktown campaign, Lieutenant Carl Black. In late June, Gentile traveled with a group of San Diego police officers to the Colorado River. The group included Lieutenant Black, two police department sergeants, and the girlfriends of Black and one of the sergeants. Black later contacted the probation department regarding Gentile's sentencing for her prostitution conviction and recommended that she receive a work furlough. Later that summer, Gentile complained to Averick's supervisor, Sergeant Harold Godarzi, that Averick had been sexually harassing her. She claimed that Averick had had sex with her while he was in uniform, and that he had written a letter to the presiding judge on her upcoming prostitution conviction sentencing, asking for leniency. According to Gentile, he gave her $50 and a letter and expected sex in return. Averick admitted to the letter, but denied paying or having sex with Gentile. In the fall of the same year, Gentile became an informant for the Internal Affairs Division of the San Diego Police Department. The police Department was aware that something, you know, something was corrupt, and so Internal Affairs actually had her wired at times. Um, as she was meeting with uh, other people from law enforcement. And so um, it was never made completely clear to me, and it may not have been made completely clear, clear to her, um, what, it, what it was, <clears throat> what the investigation was all about. But, but something was dirty. <laughs> and so she never knew for sure who, who it was they were trying to uh, uh, get information on. But the problem is, you know, as some, when someone discovers that you're wired and that the, the conversations have been recorded, um, retaliation does occur. In January of 1985, Officer Averick and Lieutenant Black were fired from the police department. However, Black was quickly reinstated but demoted to sergeant after he appealed to the police chief. According to Hardy and Davis, sexual exploitation and harassment of prostitutes by San Diego police officers was common during the 1980s. There was one cop that would uh, spend a lot of time with me. He was really, uh, I, I, from what I saw, attracted to me. Um, would pick me up a lot. And, um, you know, for a long time, he would just cruise by me and not in, in a way that a cop would cruise by and say, you need to leave, or he would just cruise by me. He watched me for a long, long, long time. Um, then he would start picking me up. He would never get out. He would just pull up and tell me to get in. Based on, you know, my relationship with him as far as him cruising past me for um, months, I um, figured he was somewhat safe, so I would get in, just get in. And after a while, it at, for, in the beginning, it, he would just ride me around, and after a while, it would be... Uh, there, he would ask me to do sexual favors in the back seat, and then usually I would leave and I would feel somewhat kind of protected. Um, if, from what I remember, he may or may not have been a sergeant. Um, he may have been, based on what I remember. Um, he was really nice, pretty passive, always quiet. He never said a lot. And I think he just didn't want me to know his voice. Unlike Gentile, prostitutes, including Davis, 
didn't usually report incidents of sexual exploitation by police officers to law enforcement. It's a secretive society, so you don't hear people, you know, the cop that just tried to arrest me last night also tried to rape me. That type of dialogue does not come up. I never told another cop. I could have been with that cop and had another cop stop me 10 minutes later. I never thought to have a dialogue with the next cop about the cop that just, no. you know, I was in the back seat with. I, I think going to jail is so traumatic that it's like, why bring up something where they're not gonna listen to anyone if they're getting ready to take you to jail. Yeah. They assume you're bringing something up to try to get out of it. Thomas Street was a former San Diego Sheriff's Department homicide detective and was the lead detective in the initial investigation of Gentile's murder. During his investigation, he met San Diego police officer Bob Canlon. There were, collaterally, there were other things that the San Diego Police Department had uh, developed, which were uh, uh, operations to basically drive the uh, prostitutes off the streets, uh, such as uh, citing them uh, for jaywalking, uh, loitering, and you name it. And that was the way that uh, Mr. Canlon had come in contact with her. He was impressed by the fact uh, that uh, she was articulate, she was intelligent, uh, introspective, all of those sorts of things, uh, which is, sounds uh, good for her, like it's good for her, but it's actually bad for her based upon the fact that she's having these uh, episodes with uh, active duty police officers because the fact that she's articulate, well-spoken, introspective, and all of that makes her a big threat. In March of 1985, Gentile filed an harassment claim against seven San Diego Police Department officers. Gentile alleged that the police officers harassed her from May of 1984 to January of 1985. Her claim included incidents where police officers continuously cited her for traffic violations while she was driving home, and sometimes followed her all the way home. She started indicating to me that she was being harassed by, by law enforcement. They were following her around, and I didn't fully comprehend what she was saying until she brought in a stack of tickets and citations. Um, it was certainly an excess of 10, it might have been an excess of 20, but there was just citations for dropping the cigarette on the ground, for parking more than 18 inches. I mean, it was just, they were following her around. So at that point, I filed, um, <coughs> we filed a second action with, you know, for, for harassment. And that, that case was pending um, at the time that she met her demise. In May of 1985, Gentile testified in Officer Larry Averick's civil service appeal hearing. The hearing included testimony regarding her relationships with both Officer Averick and Lieutenant Black. There was a civil service hearing, and I believe it was, um, I believe two officers were, were being addressed. One was Larry Averick, uh, and another one was Carl Black. Um, and so she was called as a witness. She, it wasn't a hearing about her. She was called as a witness to testify as to any possible wrongdoing by Mr. Averick or Mr. Black. The allegations were that Donna Gentile had sex with officers and that officers had used their influence to help her avoid arrest. Uh, well, he was over my apartment a few times. Um, I had sexual contact with him. Officer Larry Averick was fired. Lieutenant Carl Black was demoted to sergeant. Both cases are on appeal. Black's appeal hearing took place one month later on June 25th, two days after Gentile's body was found. Approximately two weeks later, the Civil Service Commission rendered its decision regarding the two officers. They decided that Black's demotion would stand based on the fact that he tried to use his position to influence the probation department. However, the commission cited that Black was naive and that Gentile manipulated him. He was reinstated to lieutenant one year later. Averick's appeal was unsuccessful. The commission decided his conduct was inappropriate because he provided inside information to Gentile during vice operations. Abuse of the officer's authority regarding sexual conduct with Gentile was not cited as a reason for the commission's findings in either of the appeal decisions, and no criminal charges were filed against the officers. Gentile was concerned that her actions taken against police officers would get her killed. She was fearful for her life. She, she anticipated that something could happen. I mean, she was, um, she was working as an informant. And, and 
as an informant, you know, the payoff is it'll help you on your case. Unfortunately, the risk is that um, you know you, there could be some retaliation, and so she she always anticipated. She was very fearful of retaliation. But in the end, what I remember her talking a lot about was that some things had happened to her, and um, you know I almost get this visual. I was trying to vision what she could be talking about. You know how that could apply to me and if I could be in a situation like her, but that she knew something was going to happen to her. Prior to her death, Gentilly left the following recorded statement with Mr. Holbrook. She asked him to give this statement to a local news reporter in the event of her death. In case I disappear somewhere or is missing, I want my lawyer to give this to the press. I have no intention of disappearing or going out of town without letting my lawyer know first. Because of publicity, I have been given a police scandal. This is the reason why I am making this. I feel someone in a uniform with a badge can still be a serious criminal. This is the only insurance that I have. Donna Gentile's relationships with San Diego police officers was the subject of many sensational news stories for approximately four months when the news of her death broke. Authorities believe that Gentile, who was a security guard, was also again working the streets. The landlord, who would not speak to us on camera, said he didn't believe Gentile was back on the streets as a prostitute. He said the last time he saw her was on the night of June 21st. She left home in a security guard uniform, and when she didn't return home for a week, he called police. Meanwhile, her body was found on June 23rd at Sunrise Highway in Route 8 and was identified on Monday. Tonight, sheriff's homicide detectives were sifting through her home for evidence. Tell me, was there any evidence of foul play inside there? None that we can see, however, we're not ruling that out. That means she could have been murdered anywhere? She could have been murdered anywhere, taken to that remote area and deposited there. Although detectives made the identification on Monday, they held back the news for two days. We had a, a routine uh, call out uh, concerning a female's body that had been found in a turnout uh, on the way to uh, uh, the uh, uh, mountainous area. We're going past Pine Valley. In other words, you, you go up towards Cuyamac and whatnot. There's a turnout and the body was found there. There were a lot of things at the, uh, at the crime scene that uh, became very curious uh, uh, to us. Even at the time, we were just doing routine investigations, and I had a full investigative team up there, and I don't think anyone was particularly distressed about who Donna Gentile was at that time. But we saw certain types of evidence that uh, caused red flags to go up. Uh, for instance, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the term brush out, uh, but uh, uh, what happens is a body is deposited in one place uh, in a predominantly dirt road area. This is a dirt turnout and all of the tire impressions, foot, impre foot uh, shoe prints, and that sort of thing uh, had been brushed out by someone cutting off uh, a, uh, uh, you know, some branches from some shrubbery growing around there and had obliterated all of the prints. Most people that dump bodies don't do that. Uh, so all of a sudden, uh, it begins to suggest that the individual that did that uh, may have had a pretty good impression as to what types of evidence were, uh, were significant. There were other types of evidence found at Gentile's crime scene that raised red flags for Street, including the appearance and condition of her body. One of them uh, was the fact that uh, her dress uh, had been cut uh, from the bottom seam all the way up to the side in a very, very uh, methodical uh, fashion. And I've seen a lot of people, uh, a couple thousand uh, death investigations, as a matter of fact, where garments have been cut off of someone. And if they're struggling or fighting, then you'll find uh, some slippage and maybe a little tiny bit of trauma on the body. Or the, the garment itself is not cut in a straight line. Uh, but in her case, uh, the garment was slit from the uh, bottom seam all the way up the side directly alongside of the uh, stitching which told me that at the time she was not moving, uh, she was not capable of defending herself, uh, and yet this garment uh, was, was cut off uh, in, a, in a very uh, 
almost a methodically seductive kind of a manner. Uh, she also had rocks and gravel tamped down into her throat, uh, not just stuff in her, stuffed into her mouth, but tamped down into her throat, as though some type of, uh, of an object uh, had to have been used in order to cause the uh, rocks and gravel to uh, descend that far down into the, uh, into the, into the throat. The San Diego County Coroner's Office determined that Gentile's death was caused by asphyxia due to manual strangulation and airway obstruction by foreign material. The other thing that was unusual about uh, uh, this case was the next day at the uh, autopsy when we found out that she had a fracture of her neck, uh, and I believe it was at C2, but I don't recall specifically. That sounds about right to me. Uh, which would have paralyzed her from the neck down, which would certainly have explained her inability to defend herself while this dress was being cut off. Uh, these are unusual sorts of uh, uh, things that are done to uh, the, the common prostitute type murders uh, in the sense that the individual uh, c captures the prostitute, uh, has a fantasy about what they want to do. They engage in some kind of uh, uh, sexual activity. Uh, they, off, they sometimes may take souvenirs. Uh, they, so they may plant the body in a certain position. Uh, they may want it, the body to demonstrate something or deliver a message to the public. In other words, they pose their, their victims and that sort of thing. But uh, this body was uh, off uh, way towards the uh, back portion of the, uh, of the drive of the turnout with the brush out, as I mentioned, and all of these other things. From our standpoint, it's just a little bit more sensitive from, from who we deal with, uh, the questions that we know are going to come uh, because of her background and the, really the most recent events. Uh, as far as investigation, no, it's not going to change our pattern or what we do or no, how we're going to proceed with it. The San Diego Sheriff's investigation of Gentile's murder began in June of 1985 as a routine individual homicide case. However, according to former Detective Street, the investigation was anything but routine. The investigation that started uh, began with uh, a very, very peculiar uh, set of circumstances. Commonly, as a homicide detective for the Sheriff's Office in San Diego, if I would go into any police agency, uh, and it doesn't matter if it was in the county of San Diego or the state uh, or someplace else in the United States and even in foreign countries and identify myself, I would get uh, uh, very, very good cooperation. But when I went to the San Diego Police Department to find out a little bit more about Donna Gentile and her activities and who her regulars were, she was a prostitute, uh, I was getting stonewalled. Uh, they were providing information very, very reluctantly, and I had never seen anything quite like that. And to make a long and sordid uh, story uh, uh, short and palatable, the situation uh, actually deteriorated to such an extent that uh, if a police officer on the street had some information concerning the sheriff's office investigation, particularly of Donna Gentile, they were to contact their command. Their command would refer the information to internal affairs. Internal affairs would make a decision as to whether or not to pass the information over uh, to us. According to Street, Officer Canlin, who cited Gentile during a police department prostitution crackdown campaign, was told not to communicate directly with anyone from the sheriff's department, particularly Street. Street met with the police department to find out why they weren't cooperating with the sheriff's investigation. We went and met uh, with uh, one of the individuals uh, from the uh, police department, a high-ranking officer, and explained to him, he was the commander of the uh, uh, East County substation, what uh, our purposes were in asking uh, these questions, which essentially were, who is Donna Gentile? Who are her regulars? Who knows all about her? Why can't we get cooperation from you people? What's going on? And the response that we got back from the uh, commander was, oh my goodness, that's all you want? Uh, which was even a more peculiar response. Uh, I was sitting there with the uh, sheriff's uh, administrator during a meeting with this guy. 
And he said, well, you know, it was getting a little bit of a concern when uh, Donna was alive because the phone would ring in the middle of the night. And I was very, very uh, reluctant to tell my wife that I had to go get, I had to, to uh, uh, get up and get dressed and go out and meet a prostitute. And I remember the uh, uh, sheriff's uh, lieutenant that was with me uh, and I looking at each other, uh, wondering what on earth is this all about? Uh, and essentially, uh, they began to provide some information concerning Donna Gentile. Um, and there were people within the police department that were very, very, very uh, anxious uh, to help out in any way that they could. But the administration was kind of uh, uh, taking a, uh, a, a, an askance look at uh, everything. We couldn't figure out why until I began to stumble across certain pieces of information, uh, which were that, uh, oh, guess what? Donna Gentile was like a party girl for the San Diego Police Department. Averick and Black were persons of interest in the sheriff's investigation because of their relationships with Gentile and her involvement with police department disciplinary actions taken against the officers. In the fall of 1985, Black became a focus of the investigation when a prostitute told Street that she witnessed Black and Bob Hannibal, a former San Diego police sergeant, plan Gentile's murder in May of 1985, approximately a month before Gentile's body was discovered. Hannibal was fired from the police department in 1983 based on allegations that he was involved with the prostitution alcohol organization that provided prostitutes to politicians. He was later convicted of conspiracy to obstruct justice during an investigation of the organization's activities. She said that uh, she had been uh, working the boulevard and that uh, this guy uh, picked her up uh, on a prearranged kind of a date and took her to the Hitching Post Motel, which was this uh, pay-by-the-hour place on El Cajon Boulevard near uh, Baltimore Street. Uh, and she said there was an, uh, that this individual got on the phone uh, and called someone else uh, who came in uh, and they had a conversation about making her go away, making it look like a bad date, make it look like something went wrong. And the person they were talking about was Donna Gentile. Black denied the prostitute's allegations and her account wasn't considered credible enough to file criminal charges against either Black or Hannibal. Is there any evidence that Carl Black killed her? No. Uh, is there a reason to uh, consider him a person of interest and to focus on exonerating him? Yes. Uh, was the San Diego Police Department helpful in terms of allowing that process to occur? No. Bob Bergreen, who was the assistant police chief in 1985 and later police chief in 1988, maintained that the sheriff's office misinterpreted the actions of the police department and that their intent was never to derail the investigation. Street continued with the investigation until September of 1988 when Gentile's case was integrated with 37 other female murderers identified by law enforcement as prostitutes, drug addicts, and transients, who were believed to be the victims of multiple serial murderers. Gentile's and the 37 other female murder investigations were then placed in the charge of a newly formed homicide task force. The task force consisted of members from the sheriff's and police departments and was supervised by the district attorney's office. It was divided into two separate units, one investigated the 38 serial murders and the other police corruption. Street became a member of the task force. However, he was no longer assigned to investigate Gentile's murder. Instead, he was placed in the police corruption unit and taken off the task force one year later. The task force's investigation of Gentile's murder veered in different directions. In 1990, Gentile was linked to call girl Madam Karen Wilkington, by one of Wilkington's former prostitutes. The former prostitute claimed that she saw Gentile at a party hosted by bank executives on the evening of June 21, 1985, two days before Gentile's body was discovered. Also in 1990, for undisclosed reasons, Gentile's investigation was removed from the serial killing unit but remained under the umbrella of the task force. In 1991, a newly developed genetic test called DNA was conducted on semen found in Gentile's body. The results of the tests were never made public. In January of 1993, investigators believed that Ronald Porter murdered Gentile. 
Their belief was based, in part, on the fact that Porter was recently convicted of murdering a prostitute that worked the same area of El Cajon Boulevard that Gentile worked, and was found in the same general location as Gentile. Donna Gentile's case uh, needed to be distanced from the police department's uh, interactions with her. Hence, uh, when you begin to have other cases involving prostitutes from the same general area, killed uh, in, a, in a different fashion, and yet dumped n not too far away, uh, it became easier and easier to include uh, different uh, uh, cases in that series. In late 1993, the task force, by then, whose serial killing caseload had increased from 38 to 43, disbanded. As of the date of this film, approximately 27 years after Gentile's death, no one has been charged with her murder. Her case is currently in the cold case unit of the San Diego Sheriff's Department. Donna Gentile's experiences with San Diego police officers in the 1980s and her unsolved murder is an example of the issues regarding prostitution raised by Marco St. James and the Coyote Movement. Although Gentile was not affiliated with the movement, her efforts to challenge the San Diego Police Department and assert her rights were reflective of the spirit of the movement and the debates of the time. In the end, the task force served as a public relations tool for the San Diego Police Department to repair their image, damaged by police officers' relationships with Donna Gentile and her subsequent murder.